Okay, we are live. This is the Annex, a sociology podcast. I'm Joseph Cohen from Queens College in the City University of New York. Today, we got a great guest to talk about a really interesting multifaceted topic. Joel Stillerman from Grand Valley is here, where he teaches social inequality, globalization, and cultural sociology. He's published on a wide range of topics, including popular culture, media, and social movements. And today, we're going to talk to Joel about his new book. So let's just get it up here while, we, uh, while we're talking about it. this. Identity Investments, Middle Class Responses to Precarious Privilege in Neoliberal Chile with Stanford University Press. It's a, it's a book about uh, consumption practices, economic investments, aesthetic tastes, and people's quest to uh, stay on a higher rung in the socioeconomic ladder down in Chile. Uh, and so we're going to be talking about stratification, culture, consumption, Chile in the Global South coming up next so let's begin by introducing uh joel stillerman from grand valley joel it is a, a pleasure to meet you uh welcome to the annex thanks so much for the invitation really nice to have this opportunity yeah it's great to finally meet you I, we were talking in pre-show about how uh i i followed you for uh, a lot it feels like a quite a long time on twitter i felt like i know you but this is actually the first time we're uh right. we're meeting a long time on Twitter can be 24 hours though, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> are, are you still on Twitter? Are you still doing I am, Twitter? yeah. I, I, I hung on. And, and I want to say that, uh, um, you know, a lot of people were like, you know, when, uh, I don't know what the nickname is for him now, the current owner of Twitter, yeah. um, you know, took over and started cleaning house and whatnot. Pe people were like, I'm out of here. Peace out, you know, and um, <clears throat> it's going to become this cesspool and so on and so forth. I decided to stick around for a little bit. I am on uh, Mastodon. You know, and it's a totally different vibe. Uh, very interesting, but very, very, very different. Um, and uh, I've noticed that you know a few of our colleagues and other people I knew they were they kind of like uh, fled for a while, or they were you know in abeyance or something. Mm -hmm. And and then I've seen them you know reappear. So I I think that at least what I'm observing on Twitter, I haven't seen like the extreme you know negativity. Uh, and I may just be you know. Ignorance is bliss, or something like that. But yeah, yeah. It's on Twitter. You know, I I missed it. I think the you know that I think the problem with Mastodon was was Mastodon was only sociology, whereas in Twitter it was sociology embedded in sort of other topics and information streams that I wanted to plug into. Um, and I did sort of I stepped away. I kind of stepped away from social media writ large and, and found it had some redeeming uh, effects. But like right. we lost a lot of social capital in the discipline, I think, when Twitter fell apart. What's your take on it, like its effects? I, yeah, I agree. I mean, I've learned so much from Twitter, just about from anything from what's coming out right now to, you know, journalists doing threads about something that's gonna come out in their, uh, uh, their medium. Um, and, uh, you know, lots of really interesting political discussion. I've, I've gotten into a few debates, some like more amicable than others, but um, you know, it's I've always learned from it, and I just I feel like it's uh, uh, for me it's been very positive. I'm also aware of you know particularly women and women of color just get a tremendous amount of flack. I would say that's true on social media in general, but it's it's kind of hard to watch, you know. And some of them are our colleagues, right? You know. Well, it's true in life, you know. <laughs> So, right, right. Yeah. but but there's the piling on effect and there's, uh, you know, deliberately taking stuff out of context to sort of score points and boost your, you know, follows and that kind of nonsense. Uh, that. So, so that I don't have a lot of patience for and I try and tune it out as best I can. Fortunately, I have not been on the receiving end of that. I hope I never am. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, personally, I found it to be very rewarding and I've you know, I've met people who I've then invited to come talk to my students, and I never met them in person, just like you and I. Um, yeah. And that's been just really cool. And uh, I think it's it can be a very supportive uh, uh, environment, you know, if the, you have the right mix of people and stuff. But um, yeah. it can also be just yuck. You know? It's it's difficult. You know, this podcast kind of grew out of Twitter and out of the vibe where everybody was just getting to know everybody, and all of a sudden, everybody felt very accessible. Mm. And it used to be, I think you were tied to your alumni network and the, you know, the networks that your school was plugged into and just really opened up things where people were talking from all corners. It was really wonderful. Absolutely. And I've had, you know, people contact me from, you know, Latin America, like, 
hey, you know, you want to join me in this grant proposal and I've never met it before. It's like, hey, cool, you know, right, yeah. right on. So things like that, I think sort of serendipitous connections are, are really nice. Yeah, I've actually uh, been moving on to in real life connections. I just got back from the Eastern Sociological Society. It's the first time I think I, well, I mean, we, we've been to conferences before, uh, mm-hmm. you know, since COVID, but uh, maybe life is starting to really feel like it's uh, coming back. And this was a, it's interesting to get back. Are you going, are you, I guess you go to the Midwestern? Uh, I, I don't, you know, um, I, I went to the Michigans after a long hiatus because they were nice enough to give me an award. So I was like, I'm all over that. Um, Congratulations. But yeah. Thank you. Um, and uh, I was at ASA in LA. Uh, I had a really good time. I mean, it was weird. It was sort of like the ghost conference or something. Yeah. Um, it was just not as many people. And then there were all these people saying, you know, there was a fire in the room I was in. Like there were all these weird sort of, anomalous events but i i uh i liked it and i think there was something cathartic about being back with people and you know talking about our work again and stuff like that yeah um i i had gotten you know i i even like since covid i i realized that i had become i had come to fetishize the modern technologies and like their ability to advance research and stuff like that and uh I think I had been dismissive of, you know, old school meeting people in person and interacting in person. And then, you know, we, we went without it for like three years and I really realized it was more important than uh, I, I had realized. Have you sort of had that type of reaction? Yeah, were you always sort yeah, of a real I mean, life guy? I, I think the hugs were definitely more meaningful, you know, when <laughs> we you know reunited with our classmates and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and yeah, well, you know, I'm an ethnographer. And so for me, you know, the art of conversation, especially working in Latin America, where the art of conversation is much more uh, kind of ingrained face to face conversation. So um, I love that. And I think, you know, it's unique, uh, especially, you know, I think about the work that I did with like street vendors and flea market vendors a while back. And there's something just really uh, um, exciting and uh I hate to use the word authentic because it's yeah. problem. But, um, it, it feels authentic to me. Let me put it that way. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. I, I the the incidental meetings is is something that struck me. You know, I ran into some promising young people, and you know, I feel like every conference I go to, I may accumulate like three or four new people. And like over the course of a career, you know, you do that over 15, 20 years, and it makes it makes for a sizable amount of people. That is know? a crowded Rolodex. Yeah. <laughs> yeah right i don't know if it, which no one to, uses anymore <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know what i i think it's like yeah i don't know if uh i mean there there, there might not be a, enough resources turning around the discipline for us to be doing favors or stuff but there is a real pleasure in uh you know seeing just how what's going on in other departments and interfacing with people i met some amazing well, sometimes kids sometimes it's frightening but you know. yeah <laughs> as long as the fright is what you're seeing happening outside of your department i guess it's like a little more tolerable you know right. and it's also great to see young people who are like super strong wow young people yeah. are so strong now it's like i'm glad i got a job in 1998 because i wouldn't get one now no chance <laughs> are you kidding no chance i mean yeah. they're just so good and it was, it, you know, you never know where it comes from. Uh, I also like dedicate thought, you know, I got to start encouraging students to come out to these. Saw a big group from UMass Boston. You know, they're all such smart young people. And uh, yeah, you know, I've got a couple of friends who are uh, in different departments there. Yeah, I was really, really impressed by it. I everybody. interviewed there once, didn't get the job, but that's all right. Yeah, <laughs> you know. I'm not bitter. <laughs> <laughs> I, always, I always tell young people, it's like, Getting a job is like getting married. You only have to sucker one person in, and then you're uh, and you're good. Right, that's right. Yeah. Anyhow, let's let's switch gears and uh, and and turn to your book right now. So your new book is out. It's Stanford University Press, right? Yep. Yeah, Stanford University Press. Identity investments, middle class responses to precarious privilege in neoliberal Chile, at where it's, it's like a a deep dive into like the consumption practices, the culture of Chile's middle class and, 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 and the hoops they have to, I guess, jump through to avoid being swallowed into, you know, the working class. It's uh, precarious here. I could imagine that it's even tougher down there. Before we get into like the details of, of your book particularly, like how'd you get into the Chilean middle class? What's the backstory yeah. on this? 
Yeah, it's kind of serendipitous, actually. Well, um, you may know I've been doing research in Chile since the early 90s. So I, I started out with labor and labor movements, uh, did a dissertation on uh, metal workers from the 40s to the 90s. So kind of um, <clears throat> I worked with um, Chuck Tilly and Diane Davis at the New School. And so, you know, a lot of social movements theory and comparative and historical sociology. Um, and uh, also some uh, kind of historical anthropologists, Bill Roseberry and, and Debbie Poole and historians, you know, it's like kind of a salad at the new schools, a yeah, salad yeah. of disciplines. <laughs> um, and, uh, but in the, in the, you know, very fine salad. Um, but, uh, um, not a mishmash. So, yeah, sorry, right. so I started no the working class. Um, then uh, sort of towards the end of that study, people started talking about consumption and consumerism and debt and those kinds of things. Um, and that got me uh, interested in consumption, which was a new field for me. Um, so I, you know, I did a first paper looking at interviewing the spouses of these model workers about consumption and, um, you know, interesting kind of gender and family paper. Uh, and then I started studying different kinds of shopping settings. So street markets, flea markets and malls, uh, looking at you know, social interactions, private space, public space, uh, those kinds of things. Um, so, you know, kind of moved into the consumption uh, arena. And so while, when I actually was, had my first sabbatical coming up, uh, I, I was thinking about continuing with that street market work. Hmm. Uh, and I got together with a, a senior colleague of mine in Chile, Guillermo Wormald, he's sort of sociologist of work, who I met when I was doing my dissertation research. And I said, okay, so I'm thinking, you know, either continue with this kind of market stuff or, or middle class. He's like middle class. That's what, you know, that's yeah. on the horizon. Right. So I said, OK, let's let's do it. And so it was really kind of uh, serendipitous. So, you know, obviously I spent quite a bit of time sort of thinking through putting the other proposal, blah, blah, blah. And so it, it, I initially had framed it in, uh, in the proposal as kind of middle class consumption. And then in conversations with colleagues as I was starting the project, it became clear that like that was very unwieldy. And so. Mm we narrowed it to um, uh, kind of these, these uh, small number of fields. And, you know, I got, you know, very deep into Bourdieu. And so that became kind of a, a helpful frame or, or foil for thinking about, you know, housing schools, mm. uh, aesthetics and, and, and free time. And, and of course there are numerous, you know, wonderful studies across the world that have looked at these fields and maybe methodologically in a little bit different way, but, um, I mean, obviously Borgia, but also uh, Mike Savage and his group have done a couple of books on the UK and Australia. And uh, and then, uh, you know, at the time, some of my colleagues were, were working on middle classes, too. So these are people who I was just getting to know while I was in the field. Um, and uh, so it was a bit of a serendipitous route. But, you know, by, you know, accident or whatever, um, I stumbled onto a field that a lot of people are interested in in Chile and Latin America and the world right now. So, so I'm happy that I landed here. And my joke is, you know, I started with the working class. Now I made it to the middle class. And, you know, for my coup de grace, I'll be studying, the, you know, the, the capitalist class or something. Yeah, right. <laughs> we'll, we'll see if that happens or not. Yeah. <laughs> so, but in, Chile is an interesting case, right? And it's particularly meaningful to people who study you know, capitalism and neoliberalism. And, and it might be that not all of our uh, listeners, you know, have a, a background. So can you just uh, set the stage for us a little bit like uh, Chile and maybe, you know, post Pinochet and neoliberalism? Why is Chile a particularly meaningful case? Yeah, and I guess I'll go back a little further very briefly and say that um, Chile is kind of unique in uh, Latin America in that it was a pluralistic multi-party pretty high functioning democracy, um, you know, at least to some extent to the, in the 19th century, although it was quite oligarchic, but since the 1920s, you know, you had kind of left Marxist left parties, centrist parties and conservative parties competing for the presidency and for Congress. Um, and, and that, uh, you know, made it kind of different from sort of populism that we associate with say Argentina or Peru or, or Brazil or Mexico um, or, you know, kind of uh, very unstable state systems where there's lots of violent transfers of power. So um, kind of a unique case, a little bit similar to Uruguay in that regard, mm -hmm. um, uh, although the, the party configuration is a bit different. 
Yeah. There's this massive volume that if people are, you know, have the time and, and patience by uh, Collier and Collier called Shaping the Political Arena. Uh, it was published in 1991, and it covers like I don't know, eight or 10 Latin American countries and looks at these questions about the kind of the structuring of, of the political system. And they have a thesis about how that led to different outcomes in different countries. Anyway, um, so so what happens in Chile is you have this polarization begin in the, in the late 1950s. Uh, where the left is kind of uh, flexing its muscles, the right is getting worried, and then you have this ascendant Christian Democratic Party um, that uh, appears to be somewhat hegemonic, but in the end, they kind of uh, couldn't quite keep uh, pace with the, the uh, speed of, of changes and mobilization and so on. So Salvador Allende was elected in 1970, as probably is well known, first Democratic Socialist who was you know, elected um, and very much freaked out American foreign policy um, uh, officials, as well as the right in Chile. Um, there was much political polarization, and um, the military took power with substantial support from the upper and middle classes, and even some people in the working class, okay? And that was in response to social mobilization, inflation, and um, a variety of factors. So Pinochet comes to power. Um, there were actually you know, heads of the four branches of the military uh, that were initially vying for power, but he kind of outmaneuvered them and and sort of centralized authority uh, under him. Um, and he was very influenced by a group connected to the Navy uh, of uh, economists and lawyers at the Catholic University who had participated in an exchange program with the University of Chicago uh, mm -hmm. going back to the 1950s and had, you know, drunk the Kool-Aid of, you know, what used to be called monetarism, now is called neoliberalism with uh, Milton Friedman, but even closer uh, or more influential was Arnold Harberger, who spent uh, a lot of time in Chile. I think his wife might have been Chilean, I can't remember, but there's a wonderful kind of chilling documentary called Chicago Boys that, that people can uh, get access to. I believe it has subtitles um, that really uh, interviews all those people, including uh, Ricardo French Davis. He was the outlier in the exchange group because he was a Christian Democrat and quite critical of sort of the neoliberal policies that took. So anyway, Pinochet, you know, uh, represses the left pretty significantly, uh, you know, throughout the dictatorship, but especially in the first five years, uh, suspends political parties, suspends Congress. Um, and then in 1975, starts to implement these neoliberal policies before they were adopted in the UK, the United States and other places. So Chile right. was really the test case, not because the International Monetary Fund made them uh, or pressured them, but because there was this internal configuration of power um, that allowed this to happen. And of course, if this had been done under democracy, as many people said, never would have happened or it would have happened much later and, and differently as it was the case in Brazil and Argentina and, and well, semi-democracy semi in Mexico. Yeah. Um, Right. So so you have, you know, anti-inflation policies in 1975 um, and, uh, you know, the economy crashes in 1981. But kind of in the 78 to 81 period, you also have these social reforms where they're um, expanding charter schools. Um, private so wait, charter, really, that charter schools like that was a sort of a. Huh. Yep. Yep. 60 percent of the market. Is wow. Chile right now, and uh, I think they may have eliminated the fees, but for quite some time, maybe twenty-ish years, fee charging charter schools. So they're mm. getting money from the government and charging fees, right? Mm. Um, uh, privatization of the pension funds, um, uh, uh, liberalizing of labor law to make it easy to hire and fire people, and so on. Um, so you know, a whole variety of things, and a new constitution. Right. So basically, you have the influence of Friedman, you know, with his monetarism. Um, oh, I'm always blinking out his name. That's terrible. Um, the Austrian uh, school Hayek. guy. Hmm? Hayek. Hayek. Hayek, uh, yeah. who, I, if I remember correctly, read a draft of the Constitution um, <laughs> uh, and, you know, made, you know, made some suggestions. And marked it up. <laughs> like, marked it up, basically. Yeah. Everything's good because it's free, right? You know, right. if the military is controlling the government, it's free. Ha ha. Um, yeah. And then uh, the Virginia School, Buchanan. Um, right. He was involved or influential with Jose Pinera in all of these um, social uh, welfare uh, like experiments. Reforms, yeah. Right? yeah. Um, 
So, so obviously, you know, this is there's a lot of um, transformation happening in employment, happening in, um, you know, people's lives, uh, access to schools, access to various kinds of services, uh, very high levels of unemployment uh, in uh, the early '80s, um, and then the the economy started to grow in the mid '80s, and then really took off in the '90s, right? So wait, um, let me can I just let me yeah, just sort of absolutely. summarize where I got. Yeah. So like. The backstory on Chile is that, you know, during the Cold War, I guess people equated capitalism and freedom and democracy as the same thing. But Chile was meaningful because they installed a dictatorship to impose capitalism. And that's sort of that's what I, I, I hear you to be saying. That's what's meaningful in the deep backstory is that capitalism was imposed on people anti-democratically like in a fascist way. And so it's sort of like a test case about like uh, is imposing the are imposing these policies on unwilling people good for them or not? Is that sort of the well? Certainly, uh, Milton and Arnold thought they were good for them, right? Right. That's like, <laughs> that was the think, theory. You don't think this horrible tasting medicine is good for you, but you'll thank me for it. You know? Yeah. This is hurting me more than it's hurting you. Or something yeah. Like that, right. <laughs> um, so 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 anyway, so you have this massive transformation, and of course, part of the project was ideological. Like we're going to convince these Chileans that like to mobilize and join unions and leftist parties to want to be individualistic and consumeristic and think about all these public services as consumer goods as opposed to public goods, um, and and so that was certainly the intent. OK, and so, you know, the middle class is interesting because early on there was a, kind of this idea like the middle class is going to just collapse because um, <clears throat> all these people were public employees or all these businesses were going bankrupt or they were right. shedding employees and that kind of thing. Um, but already a couple of Chilean sociologists in around 1985, Martinez and Tironi, um, found that like, oh, look, there's actually more private sector employees that are emerging in these new sectors. There's uh, freelancers. Um, so really, there was an employment shift that was going on, but kind of the, the characteristics of employment had changed. Right. Um, and so, you know, what's going on in, or what's been going on in the last few decades in, in Chile has been that, you know, you see a growth of a changed middle class mm. under, you know, successful, um, you know, market economy. Right. Um, but, and this is a big point in my book, this old middle class um, is still kind of hanging on, and they've got some political muscle. And, and this is something that I think, while I've learned tremendously from some of my colleagues' work, I, I don't think this was really front and center of their analysis, although there are others looking at other countries that have really looked at the politics of the middle class. So, yeah, you make the point that, like, Chile, Chile's middle class is not, it's, you know, it's not a homogeneous group. There's, like, there's different pieces of the middle class, and, and you spell out a typology. Do you want to sort of give us a run through? Like, so yeah. who is in this middle class? Like, who, yeah. who gets to be and, there? And first of all, just disclaimer, I mean, this is a qualitative study. This is not a, you know, Goldthorpe map of the class structure <laughs> or anything like that, okay? So just anyone who wants to bash me on that front. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so, so this is a qualitative study. It's a non-random sample, and so within the sample, and I can talk more about like where in Santiago is studying and how I approached it and so on. But just to to get at the topology, so so obviously, I mean, I was influenced by Bourdieu and sort of you know map of social space, and so I was like, hmm, let's look at secular uh, alternative schools and um, traditional Catholic schools. I bet that the parents at those secular alternative schools are going to be public employees and teachers and artists and you know mm. maybe scientists and stuff like that and i bet that um the parents in those catholic schools are going to be you know private sector employees lawyers doctors why'd you figure um, that what was the thinking uh, behind that well i just i thought that ideologically um the um the public sector folks were going to be more secular and of course there's a secular um, religious split going back to the 19th century in Chile that is was you know materialized in the political parties right okay. um, and uh, you know I also looked at these two communities so there's this kind of established middle class community that's sort of more central in Santiago and then kind of an up and coming suburb um, and my suspicion was that well, there's probably going to be more lower middle class people in La Florida, which is the more suburban community, but not suburban in the sense of rich, suburban mm -hmm. in the sense of like recently developed. 
um, which also turned out to be true, although it was there were a lot of upper middle class people there as well. Right. So basically, I've got three upper middle class groups. So we've got a group that I call activists. They tended to be people whose uh, kids were in alternative schools and who were born in the 60s. OK, mm. so the people were my age. OK, I'm dating myself, but um, <laughs> people who were born before the coup. Right. And whose parents were able to talk to them about politics and stuff. Right. Oh, okay. There were also people who were involved in the protests against Pinochet in the 80s when they were college students. Um, the next group I call moderate Catholics. These are also upper up, upper middle class people born in the 60s. Um, some of them, you know, they were much more reticent about sharing their political beliefs and attitudes. But my gut tells me there were Christian Democrats. Mm. Um, so also somewhat critical, maybe in hushed tones of the dictatorship. Um, some of them were influenced, clearly influenced by sort of social gospel, the Catholic Church, because they were doing like volunteer activities with the homeless and stuff like mm. that. Um, and that was very meaningful for them. Um, and uh, uh, both of those groups were very critical of neoliberalism um, in schools, in terms of the kind of uh, middle class people that neoliberalism has produced being very kind of competitive and materialistic and so on. Um, a third group of upper middle class people were born in the 70s. And these were people who really didn't express a lot of uh, either religious or political affiliation or mm. organizational involvement um, and, and that kind of thing. Like the alienated uh, Gen Xers, is that what? Yeah, you know, <laughs> so it's interesting because a lot of Chilean sociologists uh, around starting around 2000, maybe a little earlier, started talking about, well, you know, the dictatorship's policies really worked and all Chileans are like these individualistic, alienated, the term used was malaise, democratic malaise, you know, disaffected from the political system um, and, you know, very consumeristic and so on. And, I, I don't think that exactly captures this group of youngsters, the, the, the ones born in the 70s, but I do think that these are people who are definitely just not as plugged into organized voluntary associations uh, as uh, the older crowd. They are very um, critical of elitism and racism, which I found to be very interesting. And, and you know, I talk a little bit about some examples. And then finally, a group I call pragmatists. And these are people who are in the lower middle class, so people who kind of clawed their way up into the middle class um, from working class backgrounds or experienced downward mobility. Mm -hmm. And so these are people who uh, were much more conservative. Um, they were much more believed in the idea of meritocracy. Um, and, you know, the idea was, you know, you sacrifice so your kids can do well in school and then they can be successful professionals. And so I want a school that's like, you know, orderly, has discipline, keep the, you know, sex, drugs and rock and roll out. Um, and, uh, you know, so my kids can do well. OK, so um, and these groups have a lot of conflict with each other, at least what I observed um, as they described in their work situations, their everyday life, their their kids' schools. And so, you know, one of the, I guess, conclusions I drew from this typology is that there is no middle class. There are middle classes, and those middle classes are, um, you know, th their positions are very contested. They don't see a common sort of interest that they rally around. Like, why? what's the source of the antagonism? Well, um, I would say it is, you know, the title of the book, Identity Investments, you right. know, and I think that was one of the questions you were going to ask me about. But, you know, this idea of identity investments came to me uh, as I was, you know, kind of rethinking the, the project. And, you know, I define identity investments, I'm not, this is an exact quote, but um, as kind of the motivations for economic action that reaffirm people's values, right? right? And so, you know, the activists' identity investments were very much around their political identities, around being intellectuals or having intellectual interests. Um, the, the moderate Catholics' identity investments were very much centered around, you know, ethics, being a good person, that kind of thing. Um, the youngsters were more about, you know, professional success, but also there was a sense of justice um, uh, in relation to, you know, kind of elitism and racism. And the pragmatists were really around, you know, kind of inclusion and um, uh, being um, 
hardworking, those kinds of things. And so, you know, you put all those people in a room and they're going to get in an argument, you know, or they're, you know, or they're going to be resentful of others. Um, so on the one hand, you have, you know, moderate Catholics and, and uh, activists, they see a lot of their peers becoming really wealthy and really materialistic. And they hate that. They just find it just horrible. Um, and, uh, you know, because they adhere to these identities that they developed as kids or as college students. Um, the uh, youngsters, they see some of this established upper middle class, so people like the activists and the moderate Catholics who maybe were born in the middle class families, and they feel excluded. They want to be included in the upper middle class, and they resent that. Um, and uh, the, the pragmatists uh, are terrified of the poor. They're afraid their <laughs> kids are going to start like using slang or something like that or smoking cigarettes, right. <laughs> right? And on the other hand, they feel very, um, they experience microaggressions from upper middle class parents in their schools, uh, you know, so they're made to feel humiliated in these, you know, PTA meetings and that kind of thing. And so, you know, you can see this um, uh, playing out. Can you, uh, it's, uh, can you sort of uh, take us backstage and just uh, tell us a little bit about like, uh, the research process and like how you sort of sussed out these different value orientations and sort of practices and logics? Yeah. So, um, you know, I knew that I wanted to look at um, secular and Catholic schools. I knew I wanted to look at these two communities. I was interested in kind of these contrasts across communities. Um, but like, well, how did you find these people? Which schools to pick? There are like a gazillion schools in each of these communities, right? So uh, the first alternative school, Manuel Salas, it turned out that one of my colleagues where I was a visiting research had his kids there. And he's like, he didn't like introduce me to anyone, but he said, you know, listen, talk to this friend of mine because he's a real kind of mover and shaker in the PTA and he can hook you up. And so I did. And he was like amazing. I mean, he was, I, I kind of feel like he should like be co-author because he, you know, he did a lot of work to connect me with people in that school. That's awesome. The second was the Catholic school in Unioa, which is kind of the more established middle class community. Uh, my wife started out as a history teacher. She's now a social worker. And so she had a friend who was a counselor at that school. Mm -hmm. And she said, hey, you know, can you can you get my husband in here? And so he contacted the principal and the principal gave me a list of parents. And, um, you know, so, so I kind of got Unioa sort of got started first. La Florida was a little bit nebulous to me. It was a little bit hard to get harder to get plugged in. Um, and there, um, uh, an old friend, a very old friend of mine, uh, who um, from like the first project, the dissertation, who I'd stayed in touch with, um, and he sadly passed away just uh, about a year ago. So he's in the dedication of, uh, of the book. Um, but he, his daughter had had kids in Raimapu, which was another alternative school. And actually, uh, the the president's uh, press secretary right now, President Boric, she is an alum of that school. Um, so it's a very interesting connection to kind of Chile's politics, which I can talk more about if we have time. Um, and so I got into Raimapu. So that was an alternative school in uh, La Florida, struggling to find a Catholic school. I talked to a bunch of different people, didn't work out. Um, and one of the grad students at the Catholic University, where I was uh, located at the time, she's like, oh, I'm an alum from this Catholic school in La Florida. I'll, I'll, I'll cook you up with the, um, the principal. And so then I got in there. And then a little bit later, because I fortunately had a second year in Chile, I was, uh, got hired to be a department chair in a, at the Diego Partales University. And uh, oh, one of my cool. colleagues was like, oh, well, my mom and my aunt are actually principals at this other alternative school in uh, La Florida, if you want to interview some people there. So, you know, like any qualitative study, I mean, there's some people who kind of say, okay, I got 20 from here, 20 from there, 20 from there, and 20 from there. And it's like this perfect comparison, you know, um, mm -hmm. and I, in my experience, it doesn't, it hasn't worked that way for me. Yeah. Um, it's, it's been much more um, serendipitous, or you could say, you know, it's a function of my social networks. Um, but I, you know, I guess I feel confident in the conclusions I come to because, um, you know, some one of the early papers that came out of this project was on school choice. Mm -hmm. And a bunch of economists have, have studied school choice and they've used a lot of survey data. And guess what? They came to the identical conclusions that I came to. 
on some aspects of, uh, of that article. Um, so, so I do think that, um, you know, ethnography can sometimes actually be a shortcut to finding um, more generalizable information, although obviously you need to go back and do the, yeah. you know, larger scale, large end study. I mean, I don't see why you'd get a hard time on this stuff. Like that's how oh, it no, works, just, you know? Yeah. yeah. It's you, always, you look like at, something we always think about it, I think, as ethnographers, is like, oh, you know, the quants are going to come get me. Oh, yeah, yeah. always that the, yeah. the <laughs> it's true. The, yeah. the amount of torturing that quants have done to to quals, it's almost like there's a scar on there. So, but like, if you're yeah. looking at a true empirical case of something, of course, it's going to be more generative than imagining it. Like, I think yeah. sometimes when people jump down ethnographers' throats, they're not really thinking about like the larger process in practical terms like you gotta, well, you gotta get some you, first and you, exposure and you've got to love it when people who like have never done an interview in their life you know decide that they're going to write a tome on ethnography and what it should and shouldn't be you know the, the whole thing with uh alice goffman and stephen lubay did you hear about that yeah the, uh, yeah the, for the, sure the criminal justice guy from a lawyer from northwestern it's like yeah okay you read a lot of ethnographies you have something interesting to say but you're not an ethnographer so you know I mean, there's yeah. a part of it that's actually doing it that perhaps you don't, you know, you're not familiar with. But yeah. I, I I have tried. I am a quant guy who is in the middle of trying my first qualitative study. It's a lot of work. It's really a lot of work. Sometimes yeah. you'd rather just hammer out a regression on a data set you yeah. download. You know, yeah. like, it's like yeah. it's a ton of work, but it's actually more. I find it way more enjoyable. And, I love and, doing and, interviews and and uh, participant observation. It's my. I mean, the, the writing is the hard part, but doing yeah, is awesome. Like, I understand the generalizability issues, but I'll say my firsthand experience of conducting uh, qualitative research versus, you know, my history of doing quantitative is like, oh, wow, you, you really learn just so much when you come face to face with the people you're theorizing. <laughs> like, I don't see how right. you could do it otherwise, really. It's, you it's, know. it's not what you thought before doing yeah. the research, right? Like, you have an idea in your head of like, oh, it's going to be like this. You know. Yeah. Makes you well. It makes you you know as a quantitative researcher, you're like, wow, you know, I probably I probably came with a lot of assumptions that I didn't I didn't know about. It's yeah. it's just theorizing humans is extremely difficult, you know, and there's just not going to be any silver ball. In any case, like these uh, these qualitative versus quantitative arguments are just like spinning wheels in the mud. Like it's, it and feels I, like I, dorm room discussions, really. Oh, I kind of feel like it's it's kind of done. You know, yeah. I remember the methods wars were really hot in the '90s when I was in grad school. Yeah. I mean, the only thing that's happening right now is that I, I think that quantitative research has really started to read qualitative research carefully. And so they're kind of saying, OK, you know, where's the replicability and uh, yeah. uh, and, and these kinds of questions, um, which I guess, you know, could potentially be good for qualitative research, could turn it into kind of like a weak version of quantitative. I'm kind of on the fence on that one. I, you know, I really like the way mario small has tried to deal with some of these issues um i think he's really and he's someone who's you know ambidextrous so he kind of knows it from both yeah. sides um i just you know i just i just feel like it's it's sort of a naive argument it's like a it's a student argument really like nobody who does this stuff is like and, and nobody who does this stuff you know it, it, it lacks an awareness that their own methods are extremely you know problematic or like we'll miss a lot like it takes a mm -hmm. i feel like that's a young person behavior at this point you know mm -hmm. it's like a identity work i will identity work along the same let's get back to that though because i like mm -hmm. this this identity investment and eh, eh, th this this concept about uh identity investments like what did you learn about consumption and identity work in general from this like did you get any insights into you know how we're doing things here in america or mm. like the the general task of using consumption to jockey into you know social status or social positions what were the big insights you, you walked yeah, with? yeah so so i guess you know i mean i wrote a book on the sociology of consumption so i i you know i have a sense of kind of that broad field although it's published in 2015 so a lot's happened since then um I guess I, I framed it more as kind of a neo bordusian take on social position and, and uh, position taking as opposed to consumption per se, but there is a lot of consumption in the book. Mm. Um, and I guess one of the things which was very interesting to me um, is that if you look across these different fields, um, you find a lot, you know, there are segments of the middle class that are very anti-consumption or anti-certain kinds of consumptions, like 
I don't want to go to the mall. I don't want to live in a gated community. I hate those places, you know, and I want my crafts and my art reproductions and my books, right? right? Which is also That's consumption, a cast, right? Yeah. Um, but, but it's a different kind of consumption. So there's actually, there's, a, I want to say her last name is Sofer. She's got an edited book and she has this idea of like consuming differently, you know? So I think that there's a lot of very interesting um, exploration that could happen uh, around kind of niche-based consumption versus more mass consumption. Um, certainly people have done that in the U.S. So Jose Johnson and, and Kay Cairns have that great book on food and femininity. And uh, uh, I think a lot of that work has been done, uh, or uh, oh gosh, why am I blanking out of this name? Uh, Rich Osijo's uh, work <laughs> on uh, kind of craft uh, <clears throat> consumption or craft retail. And uh, so, so a lot of that work has been done. And I guess what's, you know, really interesting about the Chilean case is um, that it is very much imbued with people's political sympathies or religious sympathies. So the, the, the kind of, and this was, I guess, my entree into this whole discussion and the U.S. and Western Europe is, you know, kind of the discussion uh, and it's not like I, I totally disagree with this, but I kind of feel like it's become this mantra of like, mm -hmm. like the upper middle class say they're progressive, they eat organic, they buy fair trade, but really they're not. They're a bunch <laughs> of, you know, uh, status mongering, elitist, you know, anti poor, whatever, <laughs> right? Yeah. And uh, I sounds think familiar to be honest. Yeah. yeah, for sure. And, uh, yeah. You know, it's it's not as obviously not completely wrong if 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 so many people have found the same thing, right? Yeah. <laughs> but but what I find is interesting in the Chilean case is like, you know, you'll have people who are communists and they'll say, you know, like, I just, just I can't do this. You know, if I had the money, I would never live in one of these exclusive neighborhoods. I would hate it. You know, or there's there's a great quote. I'm pretty sure it's in the book. Um, woman, she's she's actually a, a psychiatrist and very affluent. I think her husband's a doctor too. Um, and she said, "Oh, you know, one of my classmates invited me to a dinner party, and uh, she's got this McMansion way up where the condors fly in the Andes Mountains, and like all this stuff in the house." And I'm like, "Good God!" You know, takes her 45 minutes to get her kids to school because they, I guess, their kids go to the same school. Mm -hmm. And she went to high school with me at the at one of the schools that I studied, one of the alternative schools. And, and she said, like, you know, we learned how to do volunteer work and we learned how to, you know, greet the janitors and kiss them on the cheek. And by God, what happened to her? Yeah. Right. So I think that if we looked at subcultures of consumption in the United States or in Western Europe, we might find some of that, although it probably is tinged with the kind of the political and cultural ideologies of those places. Yeah. Um, so, you know, thinking about maybe people who are off the grid or people who are, um, you know, decluttering or doing those kinds of things. Um, you know, I think about the Bernie bros and the, I don't know what the, the female counterpart is. Bernie I don't know either. Yeah. Like that, but, you know, <laughs> oh, these yeah. are people who are middle and upper class or highly yep. educated. Um, and they're very progressive. You know, I mean, there's obviously debates about their political strategy and something like that. That's that's kind of another question. But my point is that, you know, there are groups within the middle classes that are highly ideological and they do not fit the mold of, um, you know, either, um, you know, a highly elite suburban uh, uh, setting or kind of a, you know, mass suburban um perspective. Um, so, so I think, or, you know, kind of like the Women's March in 2017. So, so all those kinds of things. So I think that um, <clears throat> we don't want to, while we acknowledge like home sizes have gotten bigger, you know, people are ordering a lot of stuff from Amazon and so on. That's, that's all real, but um, there's a lot more going on and there's a lot of, um, you know, people's political values, people's social commitments, religious commitments that make their way into consumption. So I saw that, you know, in housing, in schools, mm -hmm. for sure, leisure time, musical tastes, um, those kinds of things. And of course, there are other groups who are like, you know, so you have the um, the activists, they're like, 
oh, well, look at these Pablo Neruda bottles in my living room, yeah. right? Um, and then, you know, the, you, you have the youngsters like, yeah, whatever, you know, mm -hmm. I don't even know why we have that on my wall, you know? Yeah. Type of thing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the pragmatists are like, look, that's the art that my kid made. You know, it's right. like this kind of DIY uh, approach uh, that's not about, you know, consecrated art or anything like that. Yeah. Um, so, so I do think some of it translates. Um, yeah. Do you think, like, do you think it is a, a transnational culture or do you think it's like people wrestling with sort of generic value questions that, you know, capitalism or modernity, mm -hmm. like the, does the difference make sense? Like one is sort of just a way of thinking that right. they get from international TV. And then there's another one where like, you know, people are all maybe all wrestling with the same mm -hmm. moral questions of, you know, what modernity is bringing us. Is that a sensible question or is that something I'm going yeah, to have to no, delete so later? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Uh, yeah. So I guess I really like, there's a media scholar, Joseph Straubhauer. Hmm. I think he's at either UT or, or Texas A&M. He's got a book called uh, like Global Television that I used hmm. in my uh, consumption book. And he talks about either layered or nested identities. And he did a lot of field work in the US Southwest, Brazil, and the Caribbean. And so one of the things he found was like, um, yes, you know, there's a segment of people that are definitely very tuned into sort of international trends. Like I'm watching Keep Me Up with the Kardashians, I'm getting my Uggs or whatever. Yeah. Um, but like, what's the most popular TV in these countries? Telenovelas, soap yeah. operas that are made, you know, in the country or the region. Um, and, uh, you know, and there are lots of class differences within these societies, obviously. Um, so I think, and, and it's going to be different, different places. So Doug Holbs, who I was mentioning uh, to you earlier, he has a really nice piece in uh, Journal of Consumer Culture with Tubu Sooner, who is, I think, is married to, or he was at the time, uh, Turkish uh, marketing scholar, um, looking at the Turkish middle class. And so they have like, an upper middle class that's like wants to be exactly like Europeans, right? And then they have this lower middle class that's much more kind of like local craft vernacular type consumption. Yeah. Um, so that's a little bit different from what I saw in, in Chile. It's kind of flipped in some ways. Um, so I think, you know, you could, I, I guess I'm always, and this is maybe the, the anthropological input into my graduate training. I'm always very keyed into like, what are people talking about in this place? And what is distinctive about this place that's not necessarily the same as what I'm familiar with, you know, in yeah. the US context. So surely, I mean, there, there are connections there. I mean, so one of the, you know, activists, he's like, oh, you probably think this progressive guy like me doesn't like rock and roll, but like, I love Led Zeppelin and, you know, I love <laughs> Elvis Presley and like, my daughters have memorized the words to Queen songs and stuff like that. So definitely there's a transnational dimension, but it's layered with this very, you know, Latin Americanist, Chilean centric um, point of view. And, so, and similarly, if you look at like some of the moderate Catholics, they're like, well, yeah, that artwork on that wall, um, that's, you know, a, a, a relative or a family member that did that. And, um, you know, so they're Chilean artists, right? Yeah. So. On the one hand, you know, you have the activists that were much more plugged into European art, Latin American art, um, and and then the the modern Catholics, like, well, the artist I know, but um, those are two different kinds of configuration of you know, locality, nation, globe. Yeah, I mean, it all rings very true. Like, what what in your in your perception, like, what are the big differences between like the Chilean class system and the American one? Like a lot of it sounds very familiar. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I would think, first of all, you know, I mean, the standard of living in, in Chile is much lower. So, you know, the, the vast majority of middle class people in Chile, I think, are in that pragmatist group, right? And um, the, um, you know, the the upper middle class were like in the top and second quintile, 60th to 90th percentile of income. So, you know, that's a pretty small group. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, there, um, I mean, one of the big sort of challenges for everyone in Chile is like, you retire and you become poor. I mean, the pension system is paying people, you know, just a miserable salary and you're locked into these, um, 
uh, pension providers that were created under Pinochet and there, you know, these oligopolies that are charging huge fees and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So more precarious, hence precarious privilege, right? right. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it's it's quite a bit easier to be middle class in the United States than it is in Chile. I mean, I just think that everyday challenges, particularly living in Santiago, I mean, the traffic is horrible and just yeah. there's like a lot of challenge. I mean, it's particularly lately, people have been talking about feeling unsafe and and that kind of thing. So you can you can definitely live in much more of a bubble as a middle class person in the United States than in Chile. You know, you're confronted with a lot more um, interesting challenges on the, in you know everyday life and on the street. Interesting but, on the public pension uh, part. You know, I remember when I did my last book on American middle class finances. I found like something like two thirds of elderly households would also be in poverty were it not for the social security program. So it's like. Sometimes maybe the the difference is really just generosity of of the socialism is what you know accounts for our, mm -hmm. the absence of our yeah system. yeah and so you know I'm in Chile the system was it was occupationally based um, uh, prior to I guess 1980 ish when they switched over to these private pension funds and of course the military got to keep the public pension funds of course mm, wonder why <laughs> right? um, that's the good uh, one that's why and uh, <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. And and uh, so if you were in a privileged occupational group, you were good, you know, when you retired. There were a lot of other people, you know, who were, you know, selling in the street markets or working as cabbies. You know, I mean, I had friends who were blue collar workers, they retired and they were driving a cab. You know, that was their pension. Right. Yeah. So. Um, so, yeah, and I know like Mike McCarthy has written a book about, you know, pensions and kind of some of those issues as well, financialization of pensions. And that kind yeah. of thing. So I, so I just think it's, you know, it's easier to be a middle-class person in Chile. Um, and, you know, there's this kind of weight of, uh, the politics that, you know, we don't feel, you know, so Nina Eliasov, if I'm pronouncing her uh, uh, yeah, name so. right, or Eliasov. Um, uh, you know, why why Americans aren't involved in politics. So there's kind of this, you know, American apathy. Um, there is a significant section of the Chilean population that isn't. But I mean, if you look at what happened in 2019 in Chile, social explosion, like a million people in Dignity Square in Santiago, like, you know, so I guess we saw that with the Women's March, but people were traveling from all over the country, these sort of people in Santiago. You know, Santiago has like 7 million people. Yeah, um, <laughs> that's a big turnout. <clears throat> And a lot of those people were middle class, right? right? So so this is where I feel like, you know, there's been a polarization within the middle classes in Chile that's a little bit different, an ideological polarization. Maybe there are some analogies here between the, you know, pro-Trump, anti-Trump kind of mm -hmm. thing or something like that. Um, you know, woke versus, you know, I don't know what you call DeSantis, but um, <clears throat> without calling him names. Um, yeah. <laughs> but uh, uh you know, there's this fracturing. So you have this one group that is, you know, drawing on these ideological resources from uh, <clears throat> the 60s, right? Um, and supporting their kids that are mobilizing uh, against the neoliberal system starting in 2006 and then culminating in 2019. Um, and then you have these other people who like voting for Pineda and like, you know, they hate the center left governments that were in power from, um, 1990 to 2010. Um, and and we see it kind of uh, coming out with a, a more recent iteration with the failed constitution, right? So um, two thirds of Chileans voted against the constitution or close to two thirds, 62%, um, whereas 78% voted for writing a new constitution in 2020. Of course, it was on, you know, there, I don't want to get too far into that, but What's interesting, I think, in relation to, you know, what I came up with in the book, and of course, I didn't anticipate this because I was done with the book before that happened, um, is more poor people voted against the Constitution than middle class people and upper class people. Um, and so I think, you know, you have this very ideological uh, middle class, whether it's, you know, more right or more left, um, and a much more kind of anti-politics, leave me alone, let me earn my living type of thing among lower middle class and working class and poor. Or, I mean, it's <clears throat> there are a lot of different dimensions of this because a bunch of people voted who had never voted before because it was an obligatory vote. But I still do think that there's that um, 
that ideologization, that's not really a word, but you know what I mean, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, of the middle class that we really don't see as much here, yeah. um, unless you want to think about, you know, the resistance versus the Trumpers or something like that. Um, it's a big country. But, There's a lot of geography. It's just, it's, it's weird here. Well, it's so much about race here. And in Chile, um, I mean, it is about race, but the, the racial language is so muted because the myth in Chile was that we're all Chileans, we're all mixed race, except that like there's half a million people who are indigenous and are oppressed in the South, right? right. That no one remembers about unless they start like burning tractors or something, right? Right. Um, and so, so, but it's it's so racialized in the U.S. I mean, it's to to a ridiculous point in my opinion, but yeah, no it's asked, a, no one asked me, so you know. Yeah, it, well, it's a it's a major major thing. Like the society's built around it. It's like just it, it's a cornerstone of this country. Sounds like Chile is sounds a lot like Canada. Self congratulatory mm. until uh, something happens, but you're like, oh well. So we were, I, I think perhaps they're a little less polite than you have a reputation of being, but <laughs> oh, we're assholes just in a different way. Yeah, uh, we're running. We're running out of time, and I I really wanted to get this last question in. Yeah, for uh, 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 an early career researcher who is interested in uh, you know jumping into the society of Latin America, uh, wants to do qualitative research. What advice would you give somebody who wants to take that path? Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> Besides, well, don't do yeah, it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I guess I would say try and find a partner um, in that country who can help orient you because you don't want to go in blind, you know, whether that's. And I did that the first time I went to Chile before I was even thinking about doing a dissertation. I was just kind of testing the waters in 1990. Um, I reached out to anyone I could find and they hooked me up with some uh, scholars of Chile or Chilean scholars. and. They said, oh, I, you know, you should go talk to, you know, the vicariate of solidarity people in the Catholic Church who were working with labor unions and that kind of thing. And that helped me a lot because I wouldn't I just wouldn't have known. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think um, there's especially if you know the language, which presumably you would if you're going to go work in a uh, another country, um, reading as much as you can of the scholarship that is produced in that country, I think, is advantageous because the scholarly debates are quite different than they are here. And that scholarship often is not cited in uh, scholarship in English. Um, and I'm definitely, you know, I'm, I don't know if you knew this, but I'm associate editor uh, for sociology with Latin American Research Review. Been doing it for the last, uh, this is my third year, I guess. Um, and so I really see those different, you know, epistemic communities when I get something from a, a peer in the US versus a peer in Latin America. Um, and it's not that, you know, one is better than the other or worse than the other. It's just very different. And so if you're trying to immerse yourself in a scene, it's very, very important to be tuned in both to what, you know, local people who are in the know, what we call gatekeepers um, are saying about who you should talk to and how you should approach it, uh, but also about what local scholars are, are saying. Yeah. And Chile is interesting, you know, for the reasons we were talking earlier. I mean, it's a very special case for anybody who's interested in, in capitalism, you know, as divorced from, uh, you know, all of the, the wonderful things that our Cold War theorizing told us was right. associated with it. For sure. Well, it was a pleasure to me. One, one more time, let me put the uh, book up on the screen. Joel's book is Identity Investments, Middle Class Responses to Precarious Privilege in Neoliberal Chile by Stanford University Press. I love Stanford. They always put out super interesting books like I've been. Uh, and well, I have you know, to say, you know, shout out to the design set because they killed it with that cover. I love yeah, no it. No kidding. Cover. Yeah. Which matters. It matters. You're going to have to be looking at that. You know, that's, that's what that's you're right. showing off. Yeah. <laughs> Joel Stillerman. It was a pleasure to finally meet you face yeah. to face. Uh, yeah. And hopefully I'll see you on the circuit. Yeah, hope to see you in Philly. And thanks so much, Joe. It was a wonderful opportunity and really fun to talk to you. All right. You've been listening to the Annex, a sociology podcast. The Annex is a production of the Queen's Podcast Lab. For more information, visit queenspodcastlab.org. My name is Joseph Cohen. Thanks for listening.